This is Earth, the planet we live on, the only planet that we have ever lived on. Based off of our estimates, 120 billion people have been alive at some point in history, and every single one of them have lived and died on Earth. For hundreds of thousands of years, this is how life was. We couldn't leave Earth. But this all changed with Yuri Gagarin, the first ever man in space. Yuri launched on April 12, 1961 and completed one full orbit around the Earth. Shortly after this, President John F. Kennedy said that the United States would have a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And you know what? We did it. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. But after that expedition was finished, we never really tried to do anything else. Why is that? In just eight years, we went from just entering space to landing on the moon's surface. Well, money was obviously an issue. The entire Apollo space program cost $25.4 billion. Another reason, though, is why should we? We have high-tech telescopes that can see for billions of miles through space, so what would really be the point? Truthfully speaking, there is no reason to go out in space except for exploration right now. However, in the future, there are two reasons we may go out and explore other worlds. Reason number one, resources. Planets, moons, and asteroids have trillions of dollars worth of resources that we could use here on Earth if the resources here become too scarce. And reason number two, colonization. The Earth is only projected to be able to hold 10 billion people at its capacity, so there is a possibility that people will go and explore other places to settle and thrive other than Earth. If we ever plan to explore the universe, we first need to know about it. And this is where we start our expedition into learning more about our place in the universe. On the first step of this expedition, we see our solar system. Currently, this is the only place where life exists and our home. However, when we look at the solar system now, it would be crazy to think about the space being nothing but gas just a few billion years ago. Around 4.6 billion years ago, the solar system was formed around our sun. Currently, there are just eight planets, hundreds of moons, and millions of other space objects like asteroids and comets. But during the time that our solar system was starting to develop, there were millions of floating rocks constantly smashing into each other. These rocks would constantly smash into each other and get denser and bigger. Eventually things started to calm down and that led us to where we are now. The moon of Earth was created around this time when another planet-sized object smashed into Earth 4.5 billion years ago. The scale of time may seem weird because we're talking about billions of years worth of time. In comparison, humans have been around on Earth for 300,000 years. If I make a line on the screen right now and say this line is the entire history of the solar system, this red part would be the entirety of human history. What can we see? Well, for one, we can't see any red on this line. The reason for this is, in comparison, the entirety of human history is just 0.0067 percent of the entire history of the solar system. With that said, the time difference between the start of the solar system and the formation of our moon is 100 million years. And from this point in history, most of the solar system was a gaseous and hot place. Eventually as time went on, the number of objects in the solar system decreased thanks to the number of collisions, and this cooled our system down. Now that the entire system has cooled down, we can see the solar system we have today. First, we have our yellow dwarf star as its centerpiece. The star is the biggest thing in our solar system, but it's actually considered on the smaller size compared to other stars. This is actually a good thing for us. Our sun has a projected lifespan of 9 billion years, 
So since it's been around for 4.5 billion years, we can conclude that there are about 5 billion years left for us in the solar system. After our sun, we have the first planet, Mercury, the smallest planet, then Venus, the hottest planet, then Earth, the planet with life, and last in our inner system, Mars, the red planet. The four planets that are all part of the inner solar system are all solid, but if we were to travel to each, we would have several problems. First, Mercury. Mercury rotates slowly, taking 59 days to complete one full rotation. With revolving so slowly, you'd be exposed to the elements for most of that time. The side that is facing the sun is constantly bombarded with heat, while the side facing away is a freezing cold land. Next is Venus. I said previously that Venus is the hottest planet, but that's because of its atmosphere. The atmosphere on Venus is about 90 times denser than the one on Earth. So the only real way to survive on Venus would be to live high enough in the atmosphere where the temperature was more survivable. However, we don't have anti-gravity technology, so this is currently impossible. I'll skip over Earth since we live here now, but climate change may cause us to make some drastic decisions in the near future. So now we have Mars. Mars is the best place for us to visit in our solar system. It's fairly close to us and not insanely uninhabitable. It doesn't have a very strong atmosphere, but this can be made up with technology. I'm sure you guys have seen the movies. Currently, Elon Musk and SpaceX are highly confident that we could land on Mars by 2026. And after that, anything's possible. Even though we've already skipped past the time where asteroids were bombarding every part of our solar system, there is still a belt of asteroids that separate the planets. The planets on the inside of the asteroid belt are rocky with a solid surface, and they're the smallest of the planets. However, on the outside of the asteroid belt, the planets tend to be massive gas giants with lots of moons orbiting them. The asteroid belt would make it difficult for us to extend past it into the outer solar system. The asteroid belt is fairly dense. On average, there are just a few million kilometers between each asteroid, which in astronomical terms is practically nothing. But once we pass the asteroid belt, we reach the outer solar system. The planets of the other solar system would be impossible for us to visit directly. They each have an insane amount of gravity and they're all gas giants. The first planet on the other side of the asteroid belt is Saturn. Saturn is obviously notorious for its rings and being the second largest planet in the solar system. Saturn has seven rings around it, but we really don't know why they're there. However, we do know that the rings will probably dissipate in somewhere around 300 million years. Saturn also has 82 moons, 53 of them being named and 29 being unnamed. Most of these moons are just stray asteroids that got caught in the orbit of Saturn, but two are the most popular. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system and the only other moon or planet where stable bodies of surface liquid have been found. Although most of Titan is made of methane, it does have an atmosphere. After Titan, we have Enceladus. Enceladus isn't entirely special, except that its surface is covered in ice and that there are hydrothermal vents under that ice. Anyone who's familiar with the start of life on Earth can tell you hydrothermal vents are important because they constantly flood the surrounding water with hydrocarbons. And that's actually what the hydrothermal vents under Enceladus are doing. So, in a sense, there's a possibility of finding life on Enceladus because of these hydrothermal vents. If we travel past Saturn and its moons, we come across Jupiter. Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system, enough so that every planet could fit inside of it. Jupiter plays a massive role in the solar system and the creation of life. With it having such a massive gravitational field, the asteroids that would be in a chaotic orbit around the Sun are traveling in a more orderly fashion, all thanks to Jupiter. Jupiter has 79 moons, but there are four main ones. Europa, Ganymede, Io, and Callisto. These moons were all discovered at the same time by Galileo Galilei, and they're all special because they were the first moons discovered to be rotating around another celestial body, beside our own moon, obviously. Also, Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It would be more comparable to a dwarf planet rather than a moon. The next planet in line is Uranus. Setting all the jokes aside, Uranus is fairly unique. As a planet. Uranus is actually tilted at 97.77 degrees, or it rotates sideways. So the north and south poles are actually near what we would call the equator. After Uranus, we have Neptune. Neptune is the farthest planet from the sun and is somewhat of a twin to Uranus. But past that, Neptune isn't entirely unique. And neither really are there moons. The last thing we can talk about in our solar system is the Kuiper Belt. 
The Kuiper Belt is a place even farther out than Neptune. Inside of the Kuiper Belt you see asteroids and small dwarf planets like Pluto, Eris, and Hamway. However, there may actually be a ninth planet lost out in the Kuiper Belt. It's entirely a theory, but if there was a ninth planet out in the Kuiper Belt, some of the orbits within the belt would make more sense. However, unless something more is found, I won't be speaking any more on it. Moving past the Kuiper Belt, we reach the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is the last stop in our solar system before we reach beyond. For the most part, the Oort Cloud consists of icy particles that form in the comets and fly towards the sun. And that's really it. Now that we've finally reached the edge of our solar system, what lies beyond? Immediately past the edge of our solar system, there's not really anything around. Most of space is empty, even when we talk about entire galaxies. Now let's talk about distance in space. Unless something drastically changes with human anatomy, there would be no easy way for us to travel between the stars. The reason is because of the sheer distance between each object and the relatively short human lifespan. The closest star to Earth is Proxima Centauri at 4.2465 light years away. Light is the fastest thing in the universe and it still takes four years to reach this one star. The fastest man-made object that we've ever created is the Parker Solar Probe, which reached speeds of 243,255 miles per hour, and that's only when it got closer to the sun. Even if we ignore the fact that the probe only reached those speeds because it was flying towards the sun, the probe would have to maintain that speed for 11,000 years for us to reach Proxima Centauri. For reference, humans started farming 12,000 years ago. And all this talk is just for the Proxima Centauri star. The Proxima Centauri system itself isn't even really interesting, so the only reason why we would visit this place would be to explore what we can. Unfortunately, in the eyes of the world, exploration isn't a good enough reason for us to attempt anything this extreme. So in the end, traveling past our own solar system is a far off prospect that most likely will never happen. However, if we continue to learn about space, we can continue to advance our knowledge of the universe and potentially answer some really important questions. Now this is where the second part of our documentary can continue. The first part was more focused on our local solar system and how unique we are, but now that we've gone past the Oort Cloud, we can truly explore the entire universe. Now that we can explore the universe freely, where should we go? This is an important question because space is so massive. We can easily get lost or trapped in an unstable orbit if we aren't careful. Well, let's just start at the center of our galaxy. We're already orbiting around it, so all we need to do is move closer. The galaxy that we live in, the Milky Way, is massive. The radius of the entire Milky Way is 52,850 light years across, which is nearly an unfathomably large amount to us humans. The entire galaxy contains not just billions, but hundreds of billions of individual stars, each with their own solar system. With so many celestial bodies around, what can cause everything to group together so well? The obvious answer is gravity. At the center of every galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole. A supermassive black hole, like you can guess, is a normal black hole, but on steroids. I've already given an introduction of what black holes are earlier on this channel, which I will link in the description. So I will continue on from that point. I recommend going and watching that if you don't know what black holes already are or how they're formed. But if you already know, you can just keep watching here. The supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy is about 14.6 million miles in diameter. For equivalent measurements, just the diameter is equal to about 186 Jupiters. And the mass is about 4 million of our suns combined. But even this black hole doesn't even compare to some of the other monstrosities out in the universe. Meet ESO 444-46. This black hole is at the center of a galaxy cluster, or in other terms, it's the center of a bunch of galaxies that rotate it. There are 640 million light years separating us from ESO 444-46, and I honestly think we should try to raise that number, because the mass of this monster is estimated at 77.6 billion solar masses, a solar mass being the equivalent to one sun. Honestly, the comparison is so extreme, so I had to find a more comprehensible comparison for my own sake. So the mass of this one black hole is equivalent to 18,000 of the black holes that are at the center of our own galaxy. Obviously going to just the biggest black hole in the universe may seem a bit unfair to just really anything else, but that's just how crazy the universe is. 
Yes, this black hole is the biggest one out there, but there are plenty of other crazy things. Next, I think we'll move on to stars that are the center of each solar system. I said earlier that our sun is a yellow dwarf star. This means that our sun will have a healthy life of around 9 billion years before it expands into a red dwarf star. Our own sun is considered a medium-sized star. However, there are plenty of other cases of absolutely enormous stars with masses of millions of our own sun. There are just so many stars in our universe that I can't really come up with a proper number just to convey how many there are. Truthfully, it wouldn't make any difference just to say that there are an infinite number of stars in the universe. But stars come in all shapes and sizes. Luckily, we've been able to somewhat categorize each star and observe how they will most likely act in the future based off our understanding of physics. The Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is one such example of how much we understand stars. This diagram separates stars into three categories, main sequence stars, giant and supergiant, and dead stars. The most common type is the main sequence stars, which vary in heat but tend to be smaller stars. An example would be more like our sun. Giant and supergiants are a little different though. These stars are separated into two different categories, blue and red. The color of the star tells how much heat is coming from it. Blue giant stars tend to be massive and hot. However, they can burn through their supply of hydrogen too quickly and die out even faster. Red giants tend to be a lot cooler and massive. These stars don't burn through their hydrogen as fast and therefore tend to be some of the longest living stars in the universe. Finally, the virtually dead stars. There are two of these. These two are the white dwarf and the brown dwarf. For this, we can kind of explain the future of our own sun. Our sun is a smaller star, so it won't be going out in any type of supernova. So the process our sun will take will take billions of years to fully complete, but it still will help us understand these two different types of stars. First, our sun will start to burn heavier elements once it burns through its own hydrogen. This will cause our sun to expand slowly and more than likely consuming Mercury, Venus, and Earth itself. Once our sun is done expanding, it will be a red giant star. I say red giant because it will be a giant compared to its original size. Now that our sun is a red giant, it will take a long time for it to burn through the other materials. But once it is done, the outer layers of the red giant will begin to move freely and the inside of the star will collapse in on itself. Violently, obviously, but really not violently enough to cause a supernova or black hole to form. This is a white dwarf, or in other words, a small, hot star. Eventually, even this heat will cool and the sun will just become a black dwarf star, which is almost the same thing as a white dwarf, but just cool. The last type of star I will talk about are neutron stars. A neutron star is very, very small and very, very dense, but that star burns incredibly hot, even hotter than a white dwarf. Neutrons aren't formed, but they're made from the deaths of other stars. These stars have to be quite a bit bigger than our own sun, but nothing too insane. And these stars have to produce a supernova along with a neutron star. A neutron star is called that because it's only made up of densely packed neutrons. In fact, here's an example I found that just to show how densely packed a neutron star is. If you were to take a teaspoon of a neutron star and brought it back to Earth, it would have 900 times the density of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now that we see just how crazy neutron stars are, let me introduce pulsars. Pulsars are neutron stars that are spinning at unfathomable speeds. This also produces an absolutely insane electromagnetic field and an insane amount of gravity. The fastest spinning pulsar that we know is that of PSR J1748-2446 AD. I feel like I just read a book. This guy spins at a constant pace of 716 revolutions per second. We don't really know too much about neutron stars and pulsars. They do have random increases and decreases in rotating speed, which we have theories on, but nothing concrete. Also, these stars can host exoplanets, which I find really interesting. That means that planets can truly be found anywhere. If there are seemingly an infinite number of stars in the universe, then not even infinity itself would be able to accurately comprehend how many planets there are throughout the entire universe. There are so many planets per each galaxy that we can't even begin to talk about them in detail. Essentially, if there's a possibility, there is a planet. As long as the possibility doesn't break the laws of physics, there is a chance that that planet is already around somewhere in the universe. There are planets of diamonds, planets that are covered in ice and fire, planets where it rains molten glass and iron, and just so many more. This is why the possibility of alien life is never counted out. If there's a chance that futuristic aliens are even just simple life forms, then there more than likely already is somewhere out there. Exact numbers are impossible to find, but there are a minimum of 700 quintillion planets in the observable universe. And the highest number I've personally seen is 21.6 
sextillion, which looks like this all typed out if you're curious. With literally so many possibilities, there obviously has to be some chance of not just alien life, but planets that have a similar composition to Earth, right? Correct. These planets are known as Super Earths or Earth 2.0. Currently, there are an estimated 6 billion Earth type planets out in the universe. With this, the possibility of alien life seems even more possible than ever before. That's enough for an alien rant. I do want to make something that talks about aliens, but that'll have to wait for now. However, we can see that we've talked about a lot. Our own solar system, black holes, and now planets. Really, what else could we talk about? How about the observable universe? The observable universe is where we live and what we can see. The speed of light can only move so fast and that's why we call it the observable universe. We do know that the universe is expanding and that there are already many things out past our observable universe, but this really does beg a series of questions. How big is the universe really? If the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? Is infinity really the only way we can count how many stars, planets, and black holes there are? If the universe is infinite, will the universe ever end? These are all hard questions to answer. Luckily, the next time we talk, we'll try to answer those questions in the only way I know how, through science and deduction. Until we talk again, peace.